everyone uh, who is here. We're thankful to God uh, for this opportunity. We're thankful to God for all who are here today. Um, we want you to know here at the Clark County Church of Christ uh, that we appreciate so very much you being here with us uh, on this first day of the week um, as we prepare to worship God uh, in the spirit and the truth. I want to thank Brother T for reading the scripture. Thank Brother T for giving us our, our opening prayer. Uh, and so as we think about today, and we think about uh, today being the Lord's day, and we think about this as the day of worship, the reason that we can worship God <clears throat> is because of the fact that we are God's creatures. Right. Now, when you think about that, it is imperative that we understand just how, uh, how God views man. And so when you think about God and you think about the fact that we, as his creatures, and through his son Jesus Christ, his children, we are made in God's image. Mm -hmm. And so that means that we are special. That means that we are important. Mm -hmm. But also, God takes note concerning us. Now, I want you to think about something. You all remember this? One of the most iconic movies known to mankind. And so what I want to do, I want you to think about something. I want you to think about the characters um, in The Wizard of Oz. You may have watched The Wizard of Oz. You may have watched The Wiz. Same thing. Uh, but I want you to think about something. And I want you to think about man in this regard. And so when you think about the scarecrow, the scarecrow needed a brain. But man is not like that. Man has a brain. Man is intelligent. Man can think. Man can reason. Man can, can, can work out problems. He can solve complex situations. So he's not like the scarecrow. Yeah. Not only that, man is not like the tin man. The tin man needed a heart. Man has a heart. He has emotions. He has feelings. He has cognitions. Better yet, he has thoughts. He has memory. So man is unlike the tin man. Man is not even like the scaredy cat, the cowardly lion. Man is, not, man is not supposed to be afraid of walking through life, afraid of everything, scared to go anywhere, scared to do anything. Why? Because we trust God. And then when you think about Dorothy, man is not lost because God has given man divine revelation so that man can know the way, he can know God's will, he can know God's mind. So when you think about the Wizard of Oz, the reason why we can appreciate the fact that we are God's children, because Genesis 1:26 and 27, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, let them, mankind, have dominion over the, the, the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, over the cattle, over all this creepy thing over the earth. God says, man is made in my image. James says in James 3 and verse number 9 that may, man is made in the similitude, the likeness of God Almighty. But I want you to consider, look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verse number 14. Notice what the psalmist says. The psalmist says in Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise thee. Why? Because or for, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. The psalmist says, one thing I do, when I look in the mirror, I recognize that when I look in the mirror, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, it's interesting, he didn't say he was perfect. He said when he looked into the mirror, he recognized he was made by a divine being, a divine creator, and God made him fearfully and wonderfully. And so, you know what, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? When I look in the mirror, I see the image of God. When you look in the mirror, you should see the image of God. We are made in the likeness, the image, the similitude of God. Do you not realize we are the offspring of God? Acts 17, verse number 24 through 26, Paul said on Mars Hill, Paul said that we are the offspring of God. We are the very gene of God. And so when you think about man, 
man is an interesting being. Man is an awesome creature created by an awesome God for an awesome purpose. So this morning, we're looking at man in 3D. Man in 3D. Because in Psalm 8, verse number 3 and 4, that was read into your hearing. The psalmist says, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast made, he says, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? Now, it's interesting. This is not the only time that that question was asked. Look at Psalm 144 in verse number 3. Psalm 144 in verse number 3. The psalmist says again, Lord, what is man? that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man, that thou makest account of him. So, so, so when you compare Psalm 8 and Psalm 144, when you contrast man, and man is contrasted to the entire universe, the psalmist wants to know, when I look up in the, when I look up in the celestial realm, when I look into the heavenly realm, I see all of the planets, all of the galaxies, the sun, the moon, all of the stars, as billion and trillion as they are, he says, when I think about all of that, God, why do you pay so much attention to us? Why are you so mindful of us? And so he says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And so this morning we're speaking from the subject, man in 3D. I'll tell you what man is. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 23. I'll tell you this morning what man is. We're looking at man in 3D. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch what Paul said? Paul said, I pray God that your whole spirit and your soul and your body be preserved blameless until Jesus comes back. So when you think about man from 1 Thessalonians 5.23, do you want to know what man is? Man is a triton being. Simply put, man is comprised of three parts. Body, soul, and spirit. And so when we think about man from a three-dimensional standpoint, man has a body, man has a spirit, and man has a soul. And so let's look at it. Why are these things so important? Number one, what about the body? When you think about the physical body, you think about your body, this body is a temporary, a housing unit for the spirit and for the soul. As good as we may try to dress this up, this is nothing but a shell. And so what we need to realize is that this body is temporal. This body is not eternal. One of the things you appreciate from creation, what God did God made man from the dust of the ground. Go back to the beginning, if you will. Look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, I want you to think about something as we go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7. Because what we like to do many times, we have a tendency. We get a little money. We get a little education. We get a little fame. We get a little notoriety. We get a little popularity. And all of a sudden, we start thinking high, more highly of ourselves than we really ought to think. And so what we need to do, we need to remember we came from the dirt. Genesis 2, verse number 7, notice what Moses says. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So, so when you start thinking more highly of yourself, what you ought to do sometimes, you ought to think about the fact of how you were formed, how you were made. And here's the thing. 
that which should keep us grounded is the reality. We came from the ground and we're going back to the ground. That's what should keep us grounded. And so we can spend a lot of money, buy a lot of nice clothes, nice shoes, and all of those things. But at the end of the day, we some good looking dirt. <laughs> and somebody say, well, Brother Freeman, I don't believe that. I don't believe it. I'll tell you what, put me to the test. This is what I want you to do. If you don't believe that you came from the dust or the dirt of the ground, this is what you do for two or three days. Don't take a bath. Don't shower. Try not to sweat. Don't do anything where you're going to get tired and, and, and worn out. And after about that third or fourth day, go wash your face. You know what you're going to see on that white, uh, that white towel? Dirt. You know why? We were formed from the dirt. And you know in Georgia, Georgia's known for many things. Home of the Bulldogs. Georgia's known for peaches. Another thing Georgia's known for, red clay dirt. The next time you see some red clay dirt, think about that's where we came from. And so when you think about the fact that God made man's body, it came from the dust of the ground, and it is temporal in nature. Look, if you will, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 7. Know what Solomon said? Solomon being the wisest man of all, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 7. Then shall the dust return again to the ground from whence it was. And then the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And, and so Solomon said, we came from the dust. And we're going to go back to the dust. There have been many occasions where I've had to stand by the graveside, do graveside committal. And one of the things we say is, oh, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. You know why? Because as they're lowering that body down in that, in that six-foot tombstone, over time, that body is going to begin to deteriorate. And so it's going to go back to the dust. If you don't believe me, look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 1. I want you to think about this. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 1, as it relates to the body. The body is temporal. It's not meant to last forever. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 1, Paul says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul could be saying, since we know this body is going to be dissolved. This body is going to be dissolved. This body that you're in right now, it's going to deteriorate. And you know, one of the things uh, about the Bible, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to recognize that God is right. All you got to do is live. This body is breaking down right now. All the people I always talk about this guy. He come around, seems like every day. His name Arthur. Y'all know him? Arthur come unannounced, unexpected. He come when you got company, come when you're not feeling well. And not only, not only does Arthur do that, another thing Arthur does, Arthur helps all of us who are, who are dealing with him. He helps us be able to know the weather. Because most folks that deal with Arthur know when it's going to rain. You know why? These bones, these muscles, these tendons, this body is breaking down. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, it's going to be dissolved. It's, it's going to break down. And Paul says we know that God has something better prepared for us. So, so what I would caution young people, Solomon would talk about the body's going to deteriorate earlier in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. In that same chapter, 
uh, Solomon was saying in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, seeing that the body is going to deteriorate, Solomon says, you look for God in the days of your youth where he may be found. And, and so Solomon recognized you don't have to live and get old. Solomon said you ought to start seeking and searching out God while you're young. Because Solomon recognized the older you get, the more bothersome and troublesome the, bo the, the body and, and the expectancies of life become. So Solomon said, you take care of God in your early days, in your youthful days. Solomon knew that what, man, what God said about the body was going to come to pass. Solomon knew it. Paul knew it. And so when you think about the body, try as you may, spend all the money on cosmetic surgery, makeup, potions, lotions, cream, all of that, it's still going to deteriorate. And so while people out here spending thousands and thousands of dollars on the body, is breaking down. You know, they got this show that comes on television called Botched, where these people, men and women, have gotten plastic surgery. And some people have gotten hundreds and hundreds of plastic surgeries, but they fail to realize. All you're doing is speeding up the progress. Because the more and more you take out of the body and out of the body, the less you're going to have for a shorter period of time. And so what Solomon says and what Paul is saying is that this body that we have right now, number dust. And so when you think about the body, you need to think about, think about the body from a temporal, temporary aspect. Not only that, what about the spirit? The spirit, when the Bible talks about the spirit, the spirit is the life force. The spirit of man is, is that part of man where he has life and he becomes uh, animated. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, notice what Moses says. Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so that's indicative of the spirit. That's right. The spirit is the life force. You won't survive too long without that life force. And the thing about the spirit, the spirit does many interesting things for the body, but for the most part, it provides life. If you don't believe me, let's go back to the book of Ecclesiastes. Look at Ecclesiastes. Look at a couple passages. You need this life force, this spirit. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 21, Solomon said, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Solomon said, The spirit of man goes upward, it goes back to God. Right. Not only that, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse number 8. Ecclesiastes 8, verse number 8. Solomon says there, There hath no man the power to retain his spirit. No man has any power over the spirit. Neither doth he have power in the day of death. You know, when you think about what Solomon's saying, Solomon's saying, um, as some people would say, when it's time to go. It's time to go. He said, you can't retain the spirit in the body. He said, there's no discharge in that war. You don't have no advantage in that war. When it's time for the spirit to exit the body, he says, man does not have, does not have an advantage in that war. And so what happens is man is destined for the grave. Look at chapter 9. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Notice what he says in verse 4 and 5. Solomon says, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Solomon says, the living know that they are going to die. In other words, Solomon says, just like ice cream goes in the freezer, we going into the grave. And seeing that we are destined for the grave, in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse number 8, Solomon said, you don't have no power over the spirit in that day. 
Look at chapter 11. Look at verse number 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse number 5. Solomon says, Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse number 5. Solomon says, Thou knowest not the way of the spirit, nor how, nor how do the, uh, the, uh, the bones grow in the womb of her that is with child. Solomon said there are some things that that man just cannot understand with his finite mind, his finite way of thinking. So Solomon says one of the things that man cannot understand or comprehend, man does not know where the body, where the, where the spirit exits the body. But one thing we know that when the spirit exits or leaves the body, that's death. Because James says in James chapter 2 and verse number 26 about the spirit. James says... For as the body, without the spirit, is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Notice now, James says, just like the body, without the spirit is dead, faith without works is dead also. So what's the point? The point of the matter is, when the spirit is no longer within the confines of the body, when it exits the body, the body is dead. Right. So you know what that means, you and our brothers and sisters? You don't have to be afraid to walk through the cemetery. You don't have to be afraid to go to the funeral home. You don't have to be afraid of the dead. Some of us are so afraid of death. Some folks don't even want to talk about it. They don't even want to think about it. Solomon said when the spirit exits that body, that person is dead. That's what death is. Death is a separation of body and spirit. And so what we need to understand is, the body is going to go back to the ground. The spirit exits the body, and it goes back to God. So what does that leave? That leaves the most important of them all, the soul. When you think about the soul, the soul of man, the soul of man is that part of man, that conscious part of man. That part of man that feels and thinks and knows and remembers, that's the soul. And the thing about humanity, everybody has a soul. The soul is that part of man that's going to outlive the body. The soul of man is that part of man which is going to go and spend eternity somewhere. So, so, so I, would, I would remind us. And I would caution us to think about the soul as the most important thing that you possess. Notice now, Jesus spends a great deal of time emphasizing the importance of the, of the soul. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, we're talking about man in 3D. The first dimension is the body. The second dimension is the spirit. And then the third dimension is the soul. So, so when you look at the teachings of Jesus, Jesus would emphasize the soul. And the value that's placed thereupon. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28. And fear not him. Which is able. To kill the body. But not affect or destroy the soul. But notice what he says. But rather. Fear him. Who is both able to destroy both the body. And soul. In hell. Jesus says. Those who are made in the image of God, those who look like you, Jesus said, you don't have to fear them. All, all they can do, the most that they can do, is they can destroy this physical body. They can't touch the soul. But who we should fear, we should fear him, which is able to destroy both the body and soul in hell. Amen. Now, notice what he says in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 Matthew 16, and look at verse number 26, because I, I believe Jesus makes a great point here. Matthew 16, verse number 26. I want you to think about this. Jesus says, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, I want you to think about what Jesus is saying. What good does it do that on one hand 
You gain the entire world. But then on the other hand, you lose the most important and precious thing known to man. For what is it profit if a man shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Now, he says that in Matthew 16, 26. And just a few chapters later in the English Bible, you get to Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus has a conversation with the rich young ruler. The Bible says in Matthew's account and Mark's account and Luke's account that this young man was rich. And so he approached Jesus and said, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may, turn, that I may have eternal life? Jesus says, why callest thou me good? For there is none good but God. Jesus says, you know what you need to do. Keep the commandments. He says, you know what? I've been keeping the commandments since I was a young man. Jesus says, okay, well, if you've been keeping the commandments, you shouldn't have no problem keeping my commandments. The young man, the Bible says, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. He had the whole world over here, but he was willing to lose his soul over here because of his possessions. So you know what that tells me, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors? Jesus says, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Do you not realize you can be rich and poor at the same time? That's what Jesus is saying. You can be rich with the world's goods, the world's materials, the world's items, the world's things, but then at the same time, spiritually, internally, you can be bankrupt. And so what the world does not want us to know, the world does not want us to realize and know and place a high value and a high premium and a high emphasis on the internal man. And so, you know, when you think about it, the world, all the world is concerned about things, things, items, goods, goods. That's the emphasis of the world. But Jesus says what you need to contemplate is not things but your soul. Now notice now, it's interesting, with that being said, look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. The most important thing that you possess is your soul. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse number 13. Notice what, notice what the Bible says. A young man approached Jesus and said, Master, tell my brother to divide or share the goods with me. You, you see, there's an emphasis, there, there's an emphasis on goods and materialism. And, and you think about as much as we live and as much as we, we, we go, go to work and we live every day. I mean, the world is concerned about us having its goods. If it ain't Amazon, it's Sheen, it's Timu, it's Walmart. I mean, all you got to do is sit at home. And I can remember a time, maybe 25, 30 years ago, they say this day was coming, that you wouldn't even have to leave the comfort of your house to go shopping. We'll bring the goods to your front door. And you think about how bad it is that, you know what, you can order some packages and you can be at a work, working hard, and somebody can be waiting on the UPS man, Amazon, or FedEx to show up at your house so they can steal your goods. You think about that. Why? Because there's such an emphasis on goods. But I want you to know what Jesus says. Jesus says, man, who made me a divider? over you all. That's not why I came. I didn't come to earth to handle small, petty uh, financial family disputes. That's not why I came. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came so that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. Jesus came so that we can have salvation. Jesus came so that we can have a relationship with God. He didn't come so that we can, we can settle these uh, petty family disputes that we should be able to take care of ourselves. That's not why he came. But what is interesting, look at Luke chapter 12, verse number 15. Luke 12, 15. Especially all of our young people. I want you to think about Luke 12, 15. Luke 12, 15. Jesus says, 
Take heed. Beware of covetousness. Notice Jesus says, beware. That's a warning. Beware of covetousness. Covetousness, as my grandmother would describe, is being long-eyed. Covetousness is always wanting something that you don't really need. So Jesus says, take heed, beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possessed. Jesus says life is not about all the stuff that you can amass, all the stuff that you can acquire. Jesus said that's, that's not what life is. So, so the, 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 the recipe is for you to understand that you don't need to be covetous. So here's the question. So here's the answer to the question. The answer to the question is this, because many people ask this profound question. What do you get the person that has, that has everything? I'll tell you what you get them. You know what you get them? You get them a Bible. Because most people that have everything, they got everything as it relates to the world's goods. They don't have everything as it relates to God's goods. And somebody may say, well, what if they got a Bible? Well, you get them more biblical literature. Because what man needs to realize is not about how much you can amass. It's not about how much you can acquire. It's not about how much you can save, even to the degree that when you keep reading Luke chapter 12, Jesus gave a parable to the brothers. Luke 12, 16, he spake a parable unto them. Now, it's interesting. The text didn't say he spoke a parable to one of them. He spoke the parable to both brothers. Because you know how it is sometimes. People always want other people to hear what should have been said. Jesus says, I'm going to let both of y'all know that you don't need to be concerned about covetousness. So he gives the parable. But what is the parable? Jesus says the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And, and so the rich man, looking out his window, seeing his crops growing and growing and growing. And so you know what the rich man said? The rich man said, so be married. You got enough. You don't have to share. You don't have to do anything. You know what God said? God said, man, you're a fool. Thou fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Now, you know, when you think about it, and you think about the fact God called this man a fool. You know what? It's, it's one thing for your classmates to talk about you. It's one thing for your family members to talk about you. It might be another thing altogether for sometimes church members to talk about you. But if God called you a fool, you're a fool. You're a fool indeed. And notice, God called this man a fool because of what he said to his soul and how he acted accordingly. He said, soul, you don't need to do anything. You got enough goods laid up for yourself. You don't have to continue to do anything. And God said, this night, this night, your soul. Is going to be required of you. So, so the lesson that you can take from Luke chapter 12, as we go into Luke chapter 16, there's a part of you that's, that's going to outlive this body. There's a part of you that's going to go into eternity. Now, the old question was asked many, many years ago, that if and when you die, where are you going to spend eternity? And so the reason why that question needs to be repeated and reminded from time to time because your soul is the most important thing that you possess. But also your soul is going to spend eternity somewhere. Now, if you don't believe me, look at Luke chapter 16. Y'all know the story. Y'all know the account of the, the rich man and Lazarus. Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse number 19. There was a certain rich man who fared sumptuously every day. And then there was a poor man by the name of Lazarus who was laid at his gate, who begged every day. His body was full of sores, and all he wanted was the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. The rich man wouldn't give him anything to eat. And so you know what happens. You know what happens in life. The Bible says, and the poor man, the beggar, he dies. 
The reason being, that's the common lot of man. Whether you rich or poor, you're going to die. Whether you educated or uneducated, you're going to die. Whether you male or female, you're going to die. So the poor man, Lazarus, the beggar, died. And then the Bible says in the very next verse, and the rich man died also. Now I want you to pay attention to something. When you look at verse number 23, Luke 16, 23, very interesting. The text says, and in hell, he lift up his eyes. Now, the word hell here is not um, Gehenna. Hell is Hades. He was in the Hadean realm. The word Hades means the realm of departed spirits. So it's interesting, though. The text says, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes. Did you know what that mean in common vernacular? The operative word today in most people's language, most, people, most people's vocabulary is being woke. In Hades, he was woke. Woke stands for enlightenment. Oh, yeah, he was enlightened. He was enlightened. And I want you to think about something now. As you go through the text, as, we, as it relates to the soul, and the soul being that part of man, that part of man that's going to live throughout eternity, the conscious part of man. I want you to think about a couple of things. In verse 23, 24, 25, and verse 28, he was conscious of the fact that he was in torments. He was conscious of that. In eternity, he was conscious of the fact that he was being tormented. As a matter of fact, verse 23 says he was in torments. Verse 24, tormented. Verse 25, tormented. Verse 28, torment. He was conscious of that in eternity. Not only that, when you read verse number 25, he was also cognizant of the fact he didn't want nobody from his family to come to this place. Mm -mm. Y'all don't want to come to this place. No, this is not a place that you want to come. Not only that, in eternity, he was not only cognizant, but he also had his memory. Abraham says, son, remember that in your lifetime when you had all of your good things and Lazarus had nothing. But I want you to think about something. In eternity, his memory was intact. You talk about a time to be alive. Is in eternity where you have all your mental faculties and you get a chance to remember all the stuff that you didn't do. You think about all the times that you rejected the gospel. You think about all the times where you didn't fix those relationships. You think about all the times where you never were restored to the faith. You think about all those times where you missed those opportunities to teach somebody the gospel. Abraham says, son, remember. You see, he was conscious in eternity. And another thing, when you read verse number 30, he says, Abraham, if somebody goes from the dead and go remind them, they'll be all right. When you read verse 30 and 31, you know he was also conscious of? He was conscious of the fact that sometimes men and women need to repent. Now, what's interesting he was conscious of being in torments, conscious of the fact he didn't want his family to come there. He remembered some things from his lifetime, but the problem is, it's too late. It's too late. And so when you think about the body is going to deteriorate, the spirit is going to leave the body, the soul is going to spend eternity somewhere until Jesus come back. And so what the, what the, what the crux of the matter is this, you get to determine where you're going to spend eternity. Because you can't control the body. You don't have any power over the spirit. But what you have control over is what a soul is going to spend eternity. And so when you think about that, here's a man who had an opportunity to do good in his lifetime. But because he refused it and because he thought he was better than the poor man, not realizing that one thing about death, death makes all of us equal. The rich man died and the poor man died. 
And so what he failed to realize is his money, his goods, all the stuff that he had in his lifetime, he could not exchange for his soul. So when Jesus says, for what is a man property? If he shall gain the whole world, he had the whole world. He was rich. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There's nothing that you can give from a monetarily standpoint, from a physical standpoint, from an emotional standpoint. There's nothing that you can give in exchange for your soul. And so you think about your vehicle. You think about your home. You think about your degree. You think about the most important thing that you own, and those things pale in comparison to what you possess the most. That's your soul. So when you think about your soul, I want you to think about there's something, there's a part of you that's going to outlive this life. And so there's a part of you that's going to be in eternity, but only you get to determine where it's going to be. But then, you know, it's interesting. When you think about it, when you think about Jesus, Jesus was comprised body, spirit, and soul. When we think about Jesus and we think about his life, we recognize Jesus had a body, did he not? Yes, sir. Hebrews 10, verse number 5. The Bible says, when he cometh into the world, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. When Jesus came into the world, God had a body ready for him to live in. And we recognize that that body that God had prepared for him to live in, that was the same body that was hung up on that cross for our sins. But then the question then becomes, what happened to his spirit? When you read Luke chapter 23, verse number 46, you know what Jesus said on the cross? Father, into thy hands, and I commend or I commit my spirit. John says, he said, he gave up the ghost. You see, his spirit went back to God. Body was on the cross. And you remember, his body was taken down from the cross by Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. That body was laid into a tomb. Eventually, that body was going to de deteriorate, as all bodies do. But then the body taken from the cross deteriorates. His spirit is going back to God. What does that leave? The soul. In Luke chapter 23, verse number 46, when Jesus was having this conversation with one of the thieves, and the thief said, Lord, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus says in Luke chapter 23, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. So let's find out what Jesus was talking about. Because some people actually believe Jesus went to hell. And so the reason you should know that he didn't go to hell, he didn't have a reason to go to hell. Because hell, according to Jesus, was prepared for the devil and his angels. And so he had no reason to go to hell, Gehenna. So where did he go? Where did his soul go? Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Begin at verse number 24. Acts 2, 24. Acts 2, 24. Whom God had raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Jesus' physical body, uh, he died. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So what Peter is quoting on the day of Pentecost here, he is quoting Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10, where David said prophetically that he would be able to go to, go to, go to, go to his grave in peace because God was not going to leave somebody else's soul in hell. Let's find out who he's talking about. He says, Thou hast made known unto me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Notice what Peter says. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. 
and his sepulchre, his tomb is with us until this day. You know what is interesting? As great as David was, David being a man after God's own heart, David still went into the grave. And Peter says, we know he's in a grave because his tomb is right over there. But what David was talking about, he wasn't talking about himself. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Notice now verse 31. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell or Hades, neither his flesh did see corruption. What's the point? In the gospel message, Jesus' physical body on the cross, taken down, he was buried, his soul goes into Hades, but God raised him from the dead, just like he said he was going to do. Man's physical body going to go into the ground. Man's spirit is going to go back to God who gave it. But that enduring part of man that we should be concerned about is the thing called a soul. And so Paul would talk about in Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, how that God is going to take vengeance upon every soul of man who doeth wrong. And so what you need to realize, the most important thing that you possess is your soul. And so we can dress up the body all we want to. We can spend uh, buku amounts of money on the body. That's your, own, that's your own prerogative. But what you should be concerned about is your soul. And so when we think about the body in 3D, if you think about all those scriptures that talk about man and how God created man, the psalmist asked the question, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? I'll tell you what man is. Man is body, spirit, and soul. This morning, what about you? You recognize man's life. Man is appointed to death, Hebrews 9, 27. And as it's appointed to men wants to die, but after this the judgment. So, so man is going to die. The body is going to go into the grave. The spirit is going to leave the body. But then what about eternity? This morning, did you not realize you're going to spend eternity somewhere? Well, where is that going to be? You get to make that determination. This morning, when you accept this simple message, that this man by the name of Jesus, Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again the third day according to to the scriptures. And you know what is interesting? Many people don't even believe that Jesus came to earth. There's a teaching known as the, uh, the swoon theory that say that Jesus did not even inhabit a body. It just, he just appeared to have come. But here's the thing. If Jesus did not occupy a physical body, we have no salvation. But thanks be to God that he did have a physical body. And that physical body went on a physical cross, and it was taken down and laid in a physical tomb, but God raised him from the dead so that we can have spiritual, eternal life. So this morning, if you take advantage of that, and so when you think about your life, think about your body. Your soul is the most important thing that you own. So this morning, when you take care of that, if you're not a child of God, how can you rest assured that your soul is right with God? All you got to do is obey the gospel. The gospel is the saving message of the death, burial, and resurrection of God's only begotten son, Christ Jesus. You know what is interesting when you read through the New Testament? Everybody that was saved was saved the exact same way. They had to obey the gospel if they wanted to be saved. There was no different message. There was not a different gospel. There was not a different teaching for salvation. Both Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free, all were saved through the message of the gospel. And that same message is available today. All you got to do is obey it. How can you obey it? All you got to do is believe it. Believe it all of your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that he died for your sins. Be willing to repent. Repentance is a change of mind which leads to a change of 
a transformation, reformation in your behavior, in your character. You got to repent. You know, somebody has once said that the most difficult command for man is to repent. But, you know, the thing about God that we should appreciate, you know, many times, like last week, we talked about uh, which gear are you in? You're in park, reverse, neutral, drive. The wonderful thing about God, as we relate this to driving, you know God allows for U-turn. Because sometimes we go the wrong way. Sometimes we do the wrong thing. But God is a God of U-turns, and God is a God who allows us to, to fix that thing and make it right. That's what repentance is. So you ought to take advantage of repentance because Romans 2, Romans 2 4, do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God lead thee to repent? And so you got to repent. And then you got to confess the mighty name of Jesus Christ before witnesses. Make that grand confession. Let the world know where you stand in relationship to Jesus. You believe that he's the Christ, the son of God, and identify with him in the water grave of baptism for the remission of your sins. This morning, if you want to be right with God and make sure your soul is right with God, why don't you come while we stand together and sing our invitation song? Jesus, Lord.